All right, so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, today we're very fortunate to have Professor Aidan Culhane joining us all the way from Ireland. Uh, she's gotten up early, especially for this, so big thank you to her. Uh, we're going to hear from her workshop on uh, dimension reduction for uh, beginners uh, and hope you enjoy it. Over to you, Aidan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peter. And um, thanks for joining me um, today. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, this is going to be an introduction on dimension reduction. And if you're on the orchestra platform, the Biconductor Orchestra platform, let me just move this out of the way, um, app.orchestra.cancerdatascience.org. Um, if you search here for DIM, D-I-M, that will actually bring up the dimension reduction for beginners. Alternatively, you can try and scroll through the eight pages, but um, I find it easier to do this. Okay, so let's open this up. Okay. Um, now, within this, this will um, open up the my GitHub account on this which includes three different um, instances here. So there's um, a short vignette, which compares singular value decomposition and principal component analysis. There's a version that takes you through principal component analysis and different versions of it as implemented in R. So different functions in R that will compute it. And what's the difference between them? How do they relate? There's Another function which looks at the basic version of correspondence analysis, which we prefer to apply to single cell RNA seq data, which is count data. And this tends to be a bit better. And then there's a, a more detailed um, instance of looking at singular value decomposition as applied to um, single cell RNA seq. Um, Peter, is it possible to find out? which of these people have a preference for uh, um could we do like a, a, a an emoji show or how many people do we actually have is that kind of possible we've got about 15 here at the minute um so that's like ex an accessible amount of people if we want all right to let's do, do uh how many options we got four there's four there yeah so the all really right. basic kind of introduction to pca or do people want to do more PCA applied to single, single cell RNA seq? All right, if you go to reactions, you can choose from the first four emojis and we'll have those as being the first four options. So I hope they're the same on everyone's Zoom, but number one is a clap, number two is a thumbs up, number three is a heart, and number four is laughing, crying. And hopefully, so, I'll be able to Yeah, so if I show the, the emojis here, reactions here, so the clap will be the short, SVD and PCA, the thumbs up is PCA and looking at the different versions of PCA um, that are available in R. The heart will be um, correspondence analysis and the crying one <laughs> is single cell rna uh, They go past pretty fast, unfortunately. They don't seem to be very permanent, the votes, but two hearts, two crying at the moment, I think, and one clap. Three claps, I think claps might have it, which was the first of them. I am just remembering that I haven't spun up my app. Yeah, sorry, they kind of uh, transient, the uh, emoji reactions. So not a great basis for a poll, I'm sorry. So if, um you haven't spun up your instance of our studio if you click the link that's within the slack um instance it's basically um app orchestra cancer data science .org. that will actually bring you up a username password do not use my url here because that will actually shut down my instance each person has their own unique url um, so please do click on the link in the Slack that Close Poso posted 
and to spin up your own version. And then if you want to follow along here, the instructions are on the GitHub page. Um, which one did we decide we were doing? I think we're starting with the big, uh, first one there, Aiden. Okay, right, perfect. Okay, so this instance, you can, you can load the library here if you want the package. It's actually called PCA. It's called PCA Workshop. So if we go library, let me just make my screen session font here a little bit bigger. Profile, oh, what's it under? You know what tools is it? How do I make my font bigger? Okay, I'll just scroll in, will I? So library PCA workshop. Okay, we'll actually load this equally. I can click on this here and I have my vignettes here and we're going to be doing this intro vignette. Okay. If so, you want a larger font, sorry, Adam, you can go to Tools, Global Options within our studio. That's what I was thinking. I couldn't remember. It says Cloud Options here. I think that's maybe it, is it? Uh, global Options there and then Appearance. Oh, uh, Global Options. Sorry. Uh, in the Appearance tab, number four. Yeah. I'm going to make the font a little bit bigger. I should do that beforehand. Okay. All right, so that's just a little bit easier, particularly for people on laptops. Um, so what I'm going to, so this is the same vignette as on the, um, the website. So you can follow either along. So within this, we're going to just look at a really simple data set. And this is the Bordeaux vin vignette that's in the, um, the AD4 package. So if I look at the AD4 package, there's a data set Bordeaux there, and it's actually a really, really simple basic data set. And we're going to use this as just our kind of like dummy data set to look at these functions. And this is just a data set which surveyed different types of wine in France. And so then the table has least restrictions as the cheapest grand cru is the most expensive. And this basically is a data set where different judges scored whether they thought the wine was excellent or boring. Okay. Um, there is a little, this was a complete and utter tangent that I probably shouldn't have included there. But when I was actually making um, this, I kind of thought of, you know, those, um, homological like fruit based color schemes and I thought right let's actually make a bar plot of the data using the homological theme in gene g plot so this is actually a plot created with the homological theme using the homemade apple script so you can actually make very very fancy plots in gg plot and that's basically what this this is it's just a bar plot of the data here so the number of judges that voted either excellent, good, mediocre, or boring here in yellow, excellent in red for the different wines. And you can very see the table wine is boring, whereas the more expensive wines up here at the top are more excellent. So we could even just look at this data and we know what we have. So principal component analysis is actually a decomposition of data that's z-scored scaled. So if we want to z-score scale the data, we can use the function scale. So by scaling the data, all we're doing here is we're centering around the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. Okay, so if when I say center equals true here, scale equals true, that is simply taking these, 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 these values here, do it manually, and, and I'm basically taking the mean, I'm taking the standard deviation and I subtract the mean and I divide by the standard deviation. That gives me the Z scores and that's how we're scaling the data. Okay. 
And that's what my value here is. And then we're running singular value decomposition on that. Okay. And this here, I've just run the function SVD. And that actually gives me three new matrices. Okay. The matrices you get from singular value decomposition or a diagonal matrix or a matrix that literally is all zeros except for four elements. In this case, it's just the vector ignoring the, the, the zero elements and that's called the diagonal matrix. And then you get the left singular values and the right singular values. Fortunately, this is a four by four data set, so you can't see the differences. Oh, sorry, this is a five by four. So we had um, the original matrix here, sorry, was four columns, so we will have four here and then we have five rows so we have a five by four in this case here okay so the um left singular values here which have got five rows will also equal the number of rows here by the number of factors in this case we've got four factors and in this case here the number the v here will equal the number of rows Okay, I think I have some images of that, don't I? Let's be deep here. Yes. So let me just bring that up. So just scrolling down here just to show this picture. So basically the elements of, 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 of PCA, or we take the original data, we z-score, normalize it, and then we're running an, um, a singular value decomposition to give us these three matrices and these three matrices have very specific nice properties that I'll talk about in a second but there's the U matrix there's the V matrix and there's the D matrix the D matrix is the eigenvalues the U matrix is your your left and your right singular values when you multiply these three matrices U by D by the transpose of V you return the original values X so the three of these matrices are a product of the original. Okay. Within R, there's multiple functions for running um, PCA. One of them is precomp. And we'll see here, if we run precomp, which is one of the R functions, if we look here at the, by default here, it's showing us the, the V values, okay, which here, I'm just, going up here. So I'm just going to show you where I describe this. The V values are the right singular values. And this, these are the um, rotation scores here. When you look at these values, you'll see you're actually returning the exact same as when we did SVD of the Z-score matrix. Okay. Um, and here, what I'm just showing is on this here, I'm just showing that the dimensions so the length of D is equal to the minimum dimension of X. Um, that the number of columns of the U matrix and the number of columns of the V matrix and the length of the D matrix will always be the same because that is the rank of the principal component or the number of components that you're returning. The um, number of rows of this U matrix will always equal the number of rows of the original matrix and equally the number of rows of this matrix equal the number of columns of the original matrix. Okay. Um, let's talk about some of these individual matrices. So I mentioned that there was this D matrix and this is the diagonal matrix. This is also the matrix that gives you your eigenvalues or tell you tells you how informative the uh, decomposition was. So how much information was captured on the components. So the idea with any dimension reduction is you're trying to reframe the data such that your um, features here, your rows and your columns. So in this case here, the excellent, good, mediocre, boring are actually weighted on the component. Now I'm going to actually use this kind of pre-comp here just because the row names are retained. When I use SVD, unfortunately it loses the row and column names. So if I have a look at this, I'm just gonna call this A. And if I look at the different matrices here, I've got the rotation matrix, which is basically the same as this B matrix. 
we can see here 0 0.53, 0 0.38. So this is, if we look at this very easily, we can see that the first component here, the excellent and the good scores are on the negative side of the component, the mediocre and the boring scores are on the, the, the positive side of the component. And if we look at the, um, Stand on um, we can begin to see here. So these are the eigenvalues here. So this is the same as the the um, D here. So here. And this basically is ranking then how we're doing. So let me just get this out from here. It's probably easier to follow along here. So the, um, okay. So the eigenvalues are the D matrix. It's just, I'm gonna follow on here. I'm just basically confusing myself there. So the diagonal matrix here are the eigenvalues here tell you how much is captured on each component. And if we want to know the percentages captured on each component, we actually just sum up the square of the values. So 76% is captured on the first component, 18% is captured on the second component, 5% on the third component. And we can actually visualize these using um, a scree plot here which basically tells you how much information is captured. So 75% on the first, 18% on the second. So we know the first component is the component that captures most of the information. Um, we can actually look here at the, um, this here, I'm just taking the U matrix from the SVD and I'm just adding the row names onto it so I can just see. If we look at the U matrix, you can see here, that the negative scores, which are associated here with excellent and good, and I'll show you the pictures in a second that make it easier to visualize, um, are associated with these grand cru ones, where the positive ones are the table wines and the cheaper wines. And you can also see this when we actually look at the V matrix here, which are the excellent wines tend to have negative scores. Um, sorry, the excellent um, negative score wines tend to be the grand cru, and the boring ones are the Vinda table, okay? And we can actually generate this, this the, in order to generate the same results here as pre-com to actually get out our scores, what we're actually doing is we're multiplying the, the, um, the, v, the U matrix by the actual diagonal of the D matrix, and that gives us our scores. Okay, and if we look here at the actual pre-comp scores up here, it's the exact same matrix. Where's the scores? Where's the scores? Oh, I didn't have to look at eight hour scores. Rotation scores. which is basically the X matrix in pre-comp. Basically, all I'm trying to show you is that if we're running pre-comp, which is one of the PCA ones, it's the same thing as running as, um, SVD of the um, single value decomposition of the actual Z-score matrix. A couple of nice features, which is why this actually works, is when we actually multiply this couple of nice properties of these matrices, so if I'm looking at um, my SVD results here, and I've got my left and my right singular values, if you multiply each of these matrices by their transpose, you get the identity matrix back. Okay, so this is a determined result. It will give you the same each time you do it. Okay. Um, and so we can multiply S dollar V by star of the transpose of S B, and we'll get back the identity. 
get back the identity matrix. What did I do wrong? Okay. Um, I have this down later on. I multiplied the wrong way around, didn't I? Um, okay, this is me going through pre compare. Okay. Peter, I'm doing something silly here. Um, these I actually have as an example in the other vignette. So in the longer vignette here, where I go through all of this in a lot more detail, I actually go through the different comparisons of each of them. And we take a different toy data set and we go through the scaling and centering, creating the SVD. And then we create the actual singular value decomposition using two, two or three different ways. So we use an eigen analysis. We run pre-comp. We do um, the SVD here on the correlation matrix. We do it on the covariance matrix. We do pre-comp. We also do prin-comp and we do factor minor and we do PCA. So there's three, four different, four or five different ways that I actually calculate PCA. And I show that each of them actually generate the same, the same scores. And I actually compare each of these results here and show that basically you're getting the same results from each of them, just to try and see. There is little differences in how each of these are computed. Um, and so the different names mean different things on each of them, but in every single case, you're getting those three matrices, the U, the V, and um, the D matrices, the diagonal matrix. And that's basically what I'm showing in this one here. But I also compute the, um, the transpose of one and the other, and I show the, the generating the identity matrix there. I'm just going to bring that up. Do, and if while I'm just doing this, do people have any, so this here is some of these multiplications that I was talking about. So if we take the U, the V, D, the diagonal matrix and the transpose of the V, if we multiply these, we regenerate the original data. In this case, I'm regenerating the original data here. We're showing that the diagonal elements are proportional to singular value decomp, it's the standard deviations. We're computing the eigenvalues here. And then I had a little, kind of script here, which allowed me to generate the same output from each of the different um, methods. So when we actually run a singular value decomposition, one of the things that we tend to do is, um, I'm just gonna clear this up a bit here, is that we actually um, visualize it. Um, and that's kind of the main thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to generate a visualization of the data such that we can explore what are the main things, what are the main um, components in the data, or what are the main um, features that are driving um, explaining the data, okay? And so the PC scores that we generated before by multiplying out the U matrix and the um, D matrix to what we did PC scores. It was the U matrix here multiplied by the diagonal of the D matrix. These explain our rows, okay? And equally, we have the, um, the column scores. And we can visualize these now on um, a plot. And one of the ways I'm going to do that is just using PCA in the AD4 package. And I'm going to use this function scatter. We're seeing here that we've got four eigenvalues, as I mentioned before, 76% is captured in the first eigenvalue, 18 in the second, if we add them together, the first two components capture 94% of the data. 
And this here is a biplot. And on that first component where we can see that excellent and good are on the negative end of the axis and that boring and mediocre and the positive, these here are our, our columns here and then our rows here indicate um, where the actual scores of the um, features are. Now, what we can see is when we're looking at this and we're interpreting it, um, we want to look in the same direction from the origin and the distance from the origin. So anything that is projected far from the origin means that it is a high weight, that it is being split by that component or that it, it is affecting that component. So this component here is splitting within the table. This is the first component, the first component on the, the horizontal, and it's splitting the table wine here from the Grand Cru Classic. These are the um, features that have the highest weight on this axis. And we can see that this is associated with splitting mediocre, mediocre boring scores from good and excellent scores. The second component is on the vertical. And that's by default. Of course, I could actually draw other, um, there, there is actually one, two, three, four components here, and we could actually split these up and say, well, what's actually in component one and three, what's in component one and four, what's in component two and three, and subsequently go through and actually work out what are the different components explaining. And the number of components that you would look at is dependent really on how much information those components are yielding. So in this case, we can see that component three is only giving us 5% of the information. So that might not be something that's of particular interest to us because this is maybe less likely to be informative, whereas we're getting 95% of the variance of the first two components. So in this case, we're really only interested in these. In the second component, we're seeing that we're splitting the um, wines here or the table wine from the, the market wine and one is described as boring and the other is mediocre. So we're looking at those um, features that are projected in the same direction on the origin. Those are the ones that are going to be, that that is the value that's going to be driving that split um, and the distance from the origin. Okay, the, um, the other thing to note is these axes can flip. So there isn't any interpretation of whether it's minus or plus. You can flip these, I could multiply these values by minus one, and I would still have the same principal components. These can flip, it's not important whether it's negative or positive. Um, you're literally just looking at what is the maximum separation on that axis and what is, what is principal component one telling us? It is telling us here that the boring and mediocre wines are being split from the good and excellent wines. It's not actually, the, the, the orientation here, whether it's positive or negative, isn't important. Okay. And the other thing I had in this little vignette was just uh, this little function explorer. And, um, and I also showed uh, Federico Marini's um, PCA plot as well here. So there's a couple of other little um, functions here for just visualizing the data. I'm just going to open up the Explorer package. So the package is Library, Library Explorer. And I can click on Explore. Explore. And then I gave it the, my result, which was Bordeaux.pca here. And this actually opens up a little shiny app. Where's my shiny app? Oh, my shiny app went to the wrong page. Let me bring it back to here. And this is kind of a nice little function if you have um, a relatively, I wouldn't do this with single cell data, but it's okay with kind of um, or kind of a regular, you know, bulk seq RNA sequencing or something like that. It shows you here the um, each of the axes, the percentage of the variance that was captured on each of the axes, the cumulative variance, for example, 76% was captured in the first 18 seconds, so 94% cumulative variance. You can change, if you had a big one here, you could change this to more. It shows you the plots of the variables. So this was the judge's scores. 
we can flip the axes here. So if I want to look at, you know, the third axis or something like that, I can do it. It gives me the actual scores. It show me, shows me the individual's plot. In this case here, these aren't labeled. I can click on show labels. And then my wine labels are turning up here by default, they're not on. Um, you can show different axes here. You can select which axis you want to do. And then the data is available as well. So that's kind of a nice little function. This function explorer works with about four or five different functions that um, compute PCA. It doesn't work with every single one, but it's actually quite a nice little package. Okay. Um, what do we want to do? Do we want to do what, um, what was the next popular thing that people wanted? Have people got questions? Yeah, we do. <laughs> thank, thank you, Paul. <laughs> I love the fact that people are actually like just fixing me where my brain is asleep in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> Glad you did it. I'm just talking about the, uh, the, the, the comments on the, uh, the Slack. Um, we can go through the second vignette in more detail if people want. Sorry, that's the wrong thing here. Um, Aiden, perhaps which before goes through the different functions, or we can go through like um, the, the single cell RNA seq, or we can go through correspondence analysis, which is another. Perhaps um, before jumping to that, uh, there's been a, there's a question by Carissa uh, on the Slack, which was that uh, is calculating in the context of RNA seq data, is calculating the log counts per million of gene expression data also considered scaling, uh, and that was asked kind of early on when you were referring to this, I think the, um, when you were scaling the original uh, data matrix. Okay, so that's actually, so, so we actually published a little review. Um, let me see if I can find it. Of course, I didn't bring it up. Um, all my, all the crazy like suggestions here. Let me see if I can find it. Actually, I probably have it link, linked in one of the things. We published a little review would open um, on kind of what the impact of different types of scaling was um, on PCA and sort of interpreting that. And this was, it was published in Frontiers um, last year. And so one of the things that we discuss is exactly that. I'll just open this, this image here. Um, so principal, principal component analysis likes continuous, normally distributed data. Um, and part of the reason that your z-score z -score normalizing the data is actually to give it that nice continuous data where it's centered. It's actually very important that the data is centered in PCA. Um, if you have data that's very skewed, you tend to get this horseshoe. Um, I think we did some pictures of horseshoes. Um, and with horseshoes, uh, let me open this as well. What you tend to get is, so this is, um, if I just show you this one here, this is a very typical horseshoe. This is some single cell RNA-seq data, and this is just an SVD. You can also see a bit of a horseshoe here. What you tend to have is the first component tends to be all on all the scores on the first component tend to be on one side of the axis, either the negative axis or the positive end of the axis, um, such that the first component isn't splitting either side. And we tend to get that when you have gradients in the data or when you have data that's not properly normalized before applying um, PCA. This is like, you know, like horrible, like this is SVD on single cell RNA-seq and SVD gives you horrible results here. You know, the first component is telling us nothing here. Um, it's not splitting anything at all up. Um, and, you know, by just doing, um, centering the data and then doing the SVD, we can begin to see 
this here is on the counts and the log counts, we can begin to see that the data are being pulled apart. And this here is when we do z-score um, based on the PC of the z-scores, we're seeing better results as well. Um, this here is just, if we just do PC, if we just do singular value decomposition of the center data, it's actually called covariance PCA. And if we do it of the z-score data, it's called correlation-based PCA. Now, in general, um, I know you were talking about the logged data. Whether the logging is, um, is it's, we normally do do PCA on log data. And normally when we're doing um, decomposition of gene expression data, we tend to log the data because it gives us a bit more of a normal distribution. When you're doing that on single cell RNA-seq, it actually isn't, ter it isn't as effective. Um, and we actually, and others have shown that there's, because there's so many zeros in these data, when you log them, you get this inflation of, of the, the zero matrix and it creates problems with PCA. PCA doesn't tend to like lots of zeros and doing um, singular value decomposition or decomposition of the Pearson residuals is actually a better approach in um, single cell RNA seq decomposition and decomposition of the Pearson residuals is, this, is actually called correspondence analysis. Um, but um, the reason I'm showing this is because sometimes people will say that they did one method or another method and you think, oh my God, these are really, really different methods. And they actually aren't. These methods are all related. A lot of these methods are all related to just eigen analysis or singular value decomposition, which are the ways that you compute this matrix decomposition. And then, so it's really important how we think that the data are normalized beforehand. Um, because the only normalization that happens inherently within PCA is just this um, z-score matrix. Um, and there's a lot of evidence to show that either dual scaling, maybe doing some sort of um, normalization on the rows and the columns beforehand is actually useful. Um, so your question here was, is calculating the log CPM of the gene expression counts also scaling? Yes, so any kind of logging here, any sort of transformation will be some sort of pre-processing of the data. And oftentimes that's actually useful and it's worthwhile, but it's worth noting that what you're doing is you're transforming the data such that then it makes the decomposition more effective. Um, and with, with this matrix, with this um, review, what we were talking about was what was the difference between scaling, centering, standardizing or transforming the data. So here you're doing the z-score transformation and here you're doing maybe a transformation like log transformation or square root transformation or an arc sine variant stabilizing transformation or maybe some other transformation here. But in all of these cases, if you're doing some sort of a singular value decomposition, you want the data to look somewhat normally distributed and centered around zero. So, Aidan, I made a quick poll on the Slack channel. I don't know if others have seen it. If they want to vote for anything on two, three, or four, um, you can. It's very unhelpful at the moment because it's tied. So, if anyone wants to add an emoji to vote for a particular vignette, uh, we'll juice. I can't see the one reply here. Oh. Sorry. It's all <laughs> one all. <laughs> oh, we've got a two. Which is the two for? What <laughs> is 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 this emoji for the fourth one? Is this is it the single cell? Yeah. So I've done two, three, and four being. Um, where did go on? The second, third, and fourth vignettes in the in the articles there. So second would be PCA, three would be correspondence, and four would be the single cell RNA seq. Okay. <laughs> so you want to go through the single cell. Okay. So the this is again, it's I in all of these we kept the data sets relatively um, simple. And so in this case here, we're looking at the Zenmix data. Um, and so the Zengmix data is a package 
within. So let's just actually open up VR Studio and let's open up that image. So this here is here. Okay. And so this is a vignette that was written by um, Lauren Shu, one of my students and myself. And it's taking through running a PCA and running a correspondence analysis on single cell RNA seq data. And so we're going to do this on the Zeng mix data. And the Zeng mix data is actually available in the package dual clustering. Um, and if I just do a question mark on it, it'll just be the, whoa. What did I just do? No, I think I just over. I don't know if, okay, so. I'm just saying no to, okay, I do have to create a bit of thing. So this here is um, this data set. So this function bring, loads in the data set for me from the dual clustering package. And I probably should have saved this to, uh, and this basically brings in the single cell RNA seq. So it was asking there if I'm saving it to a variable, it's loading it from cache, so it should be faster. Okay. And so this is a single cell experiment. And what they did was they mixed cell lines. And the, the dual clustering includes a couple of different data sets. So in one case, they mixed four cell lines in equal, not cell lines, they mixed cells. So these were PBMC cells. So peripheral blood monocytes, they, they purified out the different cell fractions and then they mixed them. And the um, four Q equal is basically they mixed four cell types in equal measure. They also have another one where they mixed eight cell types in equal measure or four subtypes in unequal measure. Um, if you actually do a question mark here on the dual clustering package. It will actually tell you a little bit about this. So this was um, Duo, Robinson and Sonison, and it was basically a paper from 2018 where they looked at evaluation of clustering methods in single cell RNA-seq using these simulated data sets. Okay, this is where the actual R package it created from. Okay. So, I'm sorry. The duo is basically, they created the R package, Zeng were the people that originated the studies. Okay. So this is a single cell experiment. It's an extension of a, a, summarized, ex, a summar, summarized experiment, which is a class in, in Bioconductor and R for holding um, gene expression data. So we have the, um, I'm just, you can get the DIM of the single cell experiment. So we have um, 15,000 genes by about just under 4,000 cells, okay? We can get our call data. And if we look at the call data here, this is the, the, the information that's associated with four, these 4,000 cells. These are the names of the, the actual rows here. Each of these were, these were barcoded. I mean, the pheno details us the type of the cell that were done here, the total number of features, and this here gives us some information about the quality scores associated with each of these from the um, quality score process. So within this here, there was pheno D. Okay, and this tells us the table, the actual um, cell type, and if I table that, We'll see what I'm talking about that there's four cell types in this. So this has got B cells, monocytes, cytotoxic and regular T cells. Okay. Okay. So we can um, do some 
couple of different approaches for doing PCA here. We can obviously run PCA using the single cell RNA-seq functions um, within Skater and Scran and those packages. But for the purposes of just kind of taking it down to bare bones again, where we could actually run just SVD or really, really simple functions in order to compute the PCA, that was the idea of what we wanted to do here. So, um, not, oh, sorry, one second. This is where I'm not copying all of the functions here. It's very second. Okay. So within the the um the matrix here. This has been already processed. There's actually two, uh, there's actually three assays within this. There's the counts matrix, the log counts matrix, and the norm count matrix. So um, these are each instances of this data set that have been processed in different ways. And so we're just saving out here the counts matrix and the log counts. Okay. And then these are the row names, the ensemble gene IDs. Um, and there's also row data, which I didn't show you associated with the rows. Okay. So then I can now run this line here because it needed the log counts. I'm going to plot the picture and then I'll describe it. Okay. So in this case here, um, we're taking the counts matrix, we're just subsetting it here to the most variable genes. So this here is just asking here, sorting the genes by variance, okay, to get the a subset of genes. So this is like a really crude feature selection approach here. Um, and this again is normally you would call the wrapper functions within these packages. Um, I'll show you the Oscar man manual in a second that you would normally use. Um, but this is just doing really simple basic functions on these just to kind of break it down. So in this case, we just want to take out the 500 most variable genes. Um, and we're just taking basically the, those that are um, logged or those that are not logged. Okay, and then we're running PCA on the counts and on the log counts. And here, if we actually look at the um, embeddings on the counts matrix, these are the data that aren't logged, we're getting this arch effect. So this here and the horizontal here is my first component. And we can see here on the positive end of the first component, we actually have no cells over here. And um, so this is a very typical arch effect. And this is something just to be wary of that you can see in decomposition. And if you do, and if you're running a pipeline and you don't check for these kind of things, then you're actually inputting the most, um, the, the component with the most variance, which is the first component, which will have the highest weights in your subsequent analysis here is actually not giving us useful information. So you're going to be doing rubbish in, rubbish out in any machine learning algorithms that you're applying subsequently. So, you know, it's always just good just to make sure that you, you don't have one of these arches. However, when we actually um, do the same on the counts in PCA, we actually do see, so it's important, this is just saying it's important with PCA, this is why you're logging it. We're beginning to see a little bit better here. We're still not seeing very good separation on the first component. We're seeing better separation on the second component. So some people will say, oh, just drop the first component and just continue with components two, three, four, five. But this also suggests that there's a problem with the, the principal component, just the Z, just PCA of the Z scores. It's probably not sufficient. Um, so within this here, there's like a couple of other like ways to look at this, um, but we're not actually getting good separation on this. 
We can, of course, what a lot of people do is they completely ignore the fact that the principal component analysis isn't so useful. And what they'll do is we'll just plot a TISNY of it. And when you throw it into TISNY or UMAP, you do tend to get that additional separation out because it will actually, it is, it is actually intrinsically trying to maximize the difference. So you do see, even though within the PCA, the first component wasn't very useful, when we actually do a UMAP or a TISNY on these data, it will actually split them out. So you kind of get around the fact that the PCA wasn't optimal. You can get a better PCA if you sort out the, um, the decomposition better in the first place. Um, so one of the things that we and others have said that it's better to do decomposition on single cell RNA seq on the Pearson residuals, which I'll talk about in a second. And um, there's a little section here that Lauren included about speed. So by default within this, when we're actually running something like pre-comp, Okay, I'll just type it in my copy and paste morning isn't working. Oh, let me just get the actual code for this. So I'll show you. This is an S3 class, so I can just type methods on it. And it will tell me here that there's two versions of methods, methods formula and methods default or the default and the so this is within the stats packages. Okay, so this is the actual code. I know that it's within the stats package. I could do question mark on it if I wanted to find out which package it's in. It's also telling me here what's in the namespace stats. I do methods here. This is an S3 class. It will tell me that there's, it's not showing me the code. If I do methods, it will actually show me that there's two different functions here. I want to look at this function here. And because it's not exported from the, the stats, names, I, stats namespace, I do three quotes here after stats. So I do stats, triple um, quotations. That will actually allow me to see hidden functions. So I can see the actual function here. So this is actually the function to run um, pre-comp here. And you'll actually see that it's actually running SVD here. Okay, that's, I just wanted to point that out. SVD is a pretty old imp um, implementation of um, of um, in, in R and it's actually using this LINPACK. Um, there are other implementations of um, PCA which are much faster, which either do um, subsampling of the data or um, they use other ways to process it. And so some of those are Erbola. So if we look here, and I'm not actually going to run all of these, if we run SVD here, we get an, an elapsed time here of four and a user time here of eight, eight seconds. If we use Erbola, we actually reduce that dramatically. So there's other implementations of SVD and most of those that are used for single cell RNA-seq or other implementations such as the Erbola. Okay, and that's it. Okay, so the last thing I just wanted to show here is um, just correspondence analysis. And there's actually a full and much more, it, what I did with the PCA where I show the different functions for PCA, I also have that for correspondence analysis, um, which is a decomposition of the Pearson residuals rather than the Z-score matrix. Um, and I show basically oof, about four or five different ways. This is PCA. PCA, PCA, PCA. This is this is a little bit about correspondence analysis. And I computed using AD4, I computed using GLM PCA, I computed using Coral, and I computed it using a factor minor, I think, as well. And I compare all of those in that in the other vignette. But let's go back to where we were. So we wrote a package called Coral, which implements uh, correspondence analysis and other extensions of correspondence analysis. You're not just doing decomposition of the Pearson residuals, you can also do um, decomposition of other chi-squared statistics, um, such as like the freeman tuckey statistic. Um, and so we can run um, Coral, which is running a decomposition of 
comparison residuals rather than the z-score matrix. Um, and again, what you're doing is you're just doing that transformation of the matrix, and then we're running singular value decomposition. And in this case, we're running uh, Airbus singular value decomposition, which will give you the same results pretty much as SVD. Okay. Um, it's giving us this little output here. It's telling us we've got 30 singular values. We've got the left and the right singular values, it's giving us the size of those. We're advantage on 15 um, features, the highly most variable features that we've picked out. We're running this here on the counts matrix. We don't need to run the um, um, log counts in this case. And uh, you can if you want, it doesn't make it worse. Um, but we can see with when we run the same embedding we're running a decomposition on the with corral we're actually immediately seeing we're seeing separation on this first axis so when we now run umap on this we actually get even better separation of our cells um, and so here we can see that on the first component we're actually beginning to see the different separations of our different cells here so we're beginning to see the b cells and the regulatory of the naive T cells are quite different to the myeloid monocyte cells. Okay. Whereas if we go back and if we visualize what we did even on the PCA, oh, this is not going to work because I did the presses. I should remember that. We didn't get the separations. So this was the PCA, the log counts of the PCA. So additional transformations are required. So it, it's just basically pointing out that these, that these things do matter. Okay. Um, and then we can do a UMAP on, on these and we get nice separate. Oh, we need to compute the UMAP first. We can do a UMAP of the corral counts or the, the correspondence analysis counts. Just we can like do a UMAP of the PCA counts and we get that even more separation in space. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, there's a couple of other examples that are there. Um, I'm not going to do this last example here. Um, there, so now we're seeing this separation space. Um, we can argue as to whether these should be further apart or less further apart. I'm happy once I see the separation space. The actual distance in space on a UMAP plot isn't as interpretable as the distance in a PCA or a correspondence analysis plot. And that's actually something I should point out. When you're looking in a PCA, you're doing decomposition of the z-score matrix. So you're looking for the um, maximum distance between, um, between your features. So it's kind of like splitting on Euclidean. So if you had went back to the old days of, 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 of clustering, it's kind of like splitting on Euclidean distance. You're looking for the maximum difference. When you do a correspondence analysis or a decomposition of the Pearson residuals, you're essentially decomposing the chi-squared statistic. And that is actually the strength of association between the gene and the sample. So what does that actually mean? Um, so if you're thinking what the chi-squared statistics here is, your, your observed minus your expected, your root your expected. If um, you have an individual gene here, so this is your gene in your cell or your gene in your sample, if it's bulk seq or if it's single cell RNA seq, what you're actually doing is you're subtracting away your expected value. And the expected value is just the product of the row weight by the column weight. So this um, expected value here is just the row, the individual row value divided by the sum of the rows, the sum of that row, and the column weight here is the individual value divided by the sum of the column. And so the product here of your row weight and your column weight is your expected value. So what this does is it allows you to see well, is how far is this from the expected? But the nice thing about also doing this is we can actually do biplots where we visualize the genes and the variables in the same space. 
there is issues with this. Um, for example, outliers can be magnified, and we see this a lot in single cell RNA seq. Um, we see that genes that are professional expressors of um, so, like islet cells um, in the pancreas produce a lot of insulin or B cells produce a lot of antibodies, antibodies or whatever. And we see sometimes that these are drive a whole component and there is ways to correct that. And we're actually, and others are working on that. And there's various different ways to reduce this. The Laos and I recently discussed it and they used kind of a square root transformation. Um, we have a couple of other solutions um, and it's something that, um, we're hopefully going to have a manuscript up on bio archive in the next week or two about that. Um, any other Adam, questions? I think we're coming up to Yeah, time. we're about at the top of the hour. So I was just going to see if there was any other final questions uh, that people wanted to raise their hands to ask in person. Otherwise, they can post to the Slack group and uh, get their answers. Uh, yeah, uh, ask them and get them answered later on. Um, but um, I don't see any hands up at the moment, so I'll just say uh, a thank you to you uh, for giving today's workshop uh, and for getting up uh, early to present it. Um, we really do appreciate <laughs> Sorry for it. Being a little bit sleepy. <laughs> no, very understand. I've been in the opposite position trying to present to North America or Europe from here uh, in Australia, and it's it's hard. So thank you very much, um, and yeah. Uh, Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Bye.